What's up, guys? It's Friday, March 20th, 2020, and this week's edition of the FritzCast, you guys are in for a treat. You guys are really in for a treat because I interview somebody, and that means my talking time is minimized. (laughs) Oh, man. I just uh, got off of a Skype call with Libertarian presidential candidate for president Jacob Hornberger. And we sat and we discussed for about 40 minutes or better all about his platform, uh, his campaign in the Libertarian Party, a little bit of how the Libertarian Party works because some of you people out there are new to it. You have no idea what's going on. And then, of course, the big subject that's going on, COVID-19. What, what, what is going on in the world? We have craziness abound. We have lockdowns. We have quarantines. We have uh, curfews. We have a ton of stuff going on. And Jacob provided some great libertarian insight to this big event that we're, that we're all going through. That at, Not just here in America, but the world is going through. I have to say uh, just a little bit of my thoughts on, on what's going on. Um, listen, COVID-19, uh, this is a coronavirus is, is a big deal. It's a great deal bigger than it was two weeks ago on my show when I said I wasn't really concerned with it. Um, because perspective opens up when reality starts to set in and that is, that's how it happened for me. And that's also the problematic part of global pandemics and how they spread. Uh, uh, here in America today, uh, if you're in California, your governor has ordered you to stay home, okay? Stay home by order of the governor. You have, like, L.A. County saying they're going to deputize city workers to patrol the streets to make sure that you're staying in your home. And if you don't stay in your home, there will be consequences, like enacting the National Guard and throwing you in jail. And I'm not, that's not being extreme, that's being legitimate. That's what's being tossed around. Which, by the way, just, you know, as an insider, nothing would be dumber than to round up a bunch of people for simply disobeying a curfew or a lock-in and throwing them in jail and overwhelming your jailing system during a global pandemic. It's just kind of dumb. Just just throwing it out there. Uh, but, you know, California it, it seems like an extreme measure, especially also stupid because they said that they're keeping essential functions open like the grocery store. Well, who you keeping the grocery store open for if you can't leave your freaking house? You're not running Instacart or or whatever delivery service because you have told everybody to stay home, stay in place. Uh, I mean, it's a step above what they were doing in China, welding doors shut, okay? I mean, that is, that is supreme authoritarian, okay? <laughs> California is not there yet. I haven't seen them weld a door yet. I Give it time, though. Give it time. Uh, you have other places like here uh, in this tri-state vicinity, New Jersey's going on uh, a curfew. I think it's like 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. because everybody knows that the virus, of course, is nocturnal and it likes to attack at night. No, the curfew like that doesn't make any sense in, in this sense. Staying home does. Encouraging social distancing does. But you're seeing a lot of scary stuff just happening carte blanche almost. I mean, really, I get it. This is a big deal. We need to minimize the impact. We need to, as they say, flatten the curve. Uh, Half of you just threw up because I used that phrase. But let me just say, let me just put it out there, okay? Here in Delaware, okay, Governor John Carney uh, initiated that uh, restaurants and bars could no longer seat people. Seat people. He said they have to switch all over to carry out or delivery. Okay? And he even extended to any place that had a liquor license and was selling liquor that you could get an alcoholic beverage with your takeout order. That's pretty cool. That's pretty... You can go to your... You can still go 
pick up food from your favorite restaurant and still get your favorite margarita. That's pretty cool. You know, that's not extremely authoritarian because his Governor Carney's focus, and by the way, I don't even like Governor Carney on the level. I really don't, but he at least has had an approach of let's try to minimize the impact on businesses. Let's try to min- minimize the impact on businesses and individuals' lives. Delaware opened up all the state parks, waived all the entrance and parking fees. So he pretty much said, I encourage you to keep social distancing. Don't go out in big groups of 10 or more. You know, don't convey like that, but the state parks are open. Go out, you know, and fish. You know, you can get your fishing license online. They switched all the stuff to online. So you can get your fishing license online. We can squabble about how it's stupid that you have to pay 10 or 15 bucks to get a fishing license, passing no test, no qualifications or anything, just because the state wants your money because you're fishing. We can squabble about that later, but they've encouraged us to, you know, go outside, ride your bike, enjoy the outdoors. Today, my wife and I were out in our backyard. We dismantled our old fire pit. We, uh, they, she and her aunt went to Home Depot and bought all new stuff like rocks and sand and all that. I have nine billion bricks that I dug up when I first bought this house um, because somebody was on a mission to bury every brick ever made in my backyard. I didn't know it at the time when I bought the house. If I'd known that, I might have passed and gone for a different house. But this is the house that I have right now. Hopefully not that much longer. So uh, we, we're redoing the fire pit. It, it was a beautiful day today. It was 80 degrees. And you know what was the best part of it? Not watching the news, not buying in, you know, not, not, not being so centralized on fear and panic and, oh, my God, are we all going to die? It was great. Delaware has been open to that. Now, I don't know how much longer that's going to last because the tri-state area, Pennsylvania, just put in – uh, uh, stipulations that they don't want businesses that are non-vital, non-essential to be open, uh, meaning that, you know, grocery stores stay open, obviously. Uh, but, you know, if if you're Home Depot or whatever, they don't want you open, you know. They don't want you open if you're Best Buy. They don't want you open if you're anybody else. Now, this is impacting workers. It's a big deal because people are out of jobs, and it's at the call of the government. It's totally at the call of the government. So, you know, what's the solution? What are some things that we could do? What would a libertarian response look like to this? Now, mind you, we still need to be cautious. Uh, we still need to limit social... We, we need social distancing. There's a ton of idiots out on spring break, you know, down in Florida, flooding the beaches with a bunch of punk teenagers who want Socialism, mind you, they want the government to take care of them, and they're saying, "Well, if I get it, I get it." You're gonna go home to your grandmother, and she's gonna contract it and probably die because you're an idiot. You know, and I hate to say it, I hate to be like that, but it, it seems like, you know, my generation, millennial and younger, it's like you have to be super duper blunt about this stuff, or otherwise, it's like, oof, well, you know, uh, uh, I could get it, and it's not gonna do anything to me. I'm gonna be fine. Think about the people around you. All right. Chris Spangle, We Are Libertarians Network, has a beautiful take on this. I I encourage you, I implore you to go check it. I'm not going to put it here because this episode is getting ready to go into the Jacob Hornberger interview, which is what you guys are going to love it. I absolutely love talking with Jacob Hornberger. Very great guest Um, and and very well-spoken individual. You're going to love it. I, I don't want to drag this out anymore. I really don't. But as libertarians, I'm more of the Chris Spangle approach. You know, um, we do need to worry about uh, social distancing. You know, there's a lot that we can do on our own, not under the force of the government. But to say that the government has no role to play in this, it's a little far-fetched in my book, at least anyway. But guys... You came for Jacob Hornberger. And that is what I'm going to give you. So without further ado, let's dive into it. This week, ladies and gentlemen, is the leading candidate for the Libertarian nomination for president, Mr. Jacob Hornberger. Jacob, welcome to the Fritzcast. Hey, great to be here, Fritz. Thanks for having me. 
pleasure. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule for this. Uh, I know we, you probably got a lot going on, um, even in these times where we're in lockdowns everywhere and all this craziness going on. I'm sure you're still very busy. Yeah, uh, pretty busy. I mean, but since they've canceled the conventions, it's not busyness in terms of getting on planes and traveling like I was doing up right. to last weekend. Yep. So we're now we're reorienting to doing stuff online. Perfect. Well, I, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a second. All right. So my listeners uh, are a mix of, of brand new to libertarianism. Uh, some of them are diehard libertarians. Uh, so some of them know the process for this, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Some of them are, are, are fresh to this. Some of them don't even know who you are. So if you can give us a little mini biography of Jacob Hornberger and what you're all about, sir. Okay, well, I'm, I'm founder and president of a libertarian educational foundation called the Future of Freedom Foundation. And I've been doing that for 30 years, and our mission is to present a very principled case for the libertarian philosophy. And I should point out that the foundation does not endorse my candidacy, and my candidacy involves running for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination. I've got to the point in my life where I've been fighting these people who have destroyed our liberty for 30 years now in the educational arena, Democrats and Republicans both. And I finally said, you know, I want to take these people on more directly. And that's in the political arena. And so I decided to seek the Libertarian Party presidential nomination to take on President Trump and whoever the Democrats end up putting up um, on behalf of the Libertarian Party. So I announced on November 2nd at the South Carolina Libertarian Party convention, and I I asked everybody, just give me a chance to earn your support. I know a lot of the party members don't know me. And since then, I've been running a campaign that's based on using pure libertarian principles, no reform, no Republican light um, type of campaign, just relying totally on libertarian principles. And there's a simple reason for that. I believe libertarian principles are our greatest asset. They are the key to liberty. And they work. They're the only solution to the healthcare crisis, the corona crisis, the um, immigration, drug war, foreign policy. And that message seems to be resonating because we've we've hit with a lot of success uh, so far in this campaign. Absolutely. And I, right now, I believe my last check, you're leading in the libertarian primaries and caucuses. However, those are not binding contests, correct? That's right, that uh, they're more in the nature of what are called beauty contests. But, you know, they, they do provide a sense for Libertarian Party members that this is the way we would wage a campaign if they make me their nominee. I've got a great campaign team. I've got the best campaign manager in the party, maybe in the country, and that's Jake Porter from the Iowa Libertarian Party. I've got a fantastic social media team. I've got the Mises Caucus that's endorsed me. And so... And we've got the triumvirate of Scott Horton and Tom Woods and, and Dave Smith that, that, have, uh, that have been promoting my campaign. So, yeah, the, it, they're not binding, but we won the Iowa caucus. We won the Minnesota caucus. We won primaries on Super Tuesday in um, North Carolina and California. We won the straw poll in California, Florida, and several other state conventions. So, yeah, things are looking really good right now. And it's, it's not because of me. It's because... This message is really resonating among libertarians of, hey, let's go into this battle with our weapons, principles and ideals and sound ideas on liberty, and let's put them up against these Democrats and Republicans. Very good. Um, when you're running for libertarian nomination, because these primaries are non-binding, you kind of refer to them in a good way as, as beauty contests. Does it change the strategy at all, or is it more let's win people over, show the delegates at the convention that we have the support behind us, or is it still a lot of going out and meeting directly with delegates and talking with them too? Well, the thrust of it is going to the state conventions and meeting with people who are running for delegate slots. The way this system works is that people go to a state convention and each state's allotted a certain number of delegates. The larger states get more delegates, like California's got 120 or something, and then Vermont's got four. Uh, so you go to these state conventions as just an attendee, as a registered member of the party, the state party and the national party. And let's say they got four slots and they've got eight people that say, I want to be a delegate. 
Well, they then have an election and each person uh, sometimes is given 30 seconds to say, this is why I want to be a delegate. And then like Vermont, well, out of those eight people that are that are running, the, the, the people at that convention will elect those four delegates. So then all the delegates get together in Austin in May, and that's about a thousand delegates. And then they decide who, want to, who they want to be their nominee. Well, the, the, the thing about these primaries and, and caucuses is they just give you a headwind going into that convention. They're, they're saying, hey, look, we can, we can go out among non-libertarians. We can make the case for libertarianism. And my thing is that, look, principles matter. We can attract votes in, among non-libertarians by adhering to our principles. And that the worst thing we could do is to run a candidate that's going to run a republican light campaign that's going to be talking about you know, reform and, and trying to fix the, the welfare warfare state. In other words, a, Repub a light version of a real Republican. And I don't think that's going to sell. I would, uh, I'd be inclined to agree with you. I think that uh, a lot of libertarians, myself at least anyway, had a bad taste in our mouth after having to go through Bill Weld being VP and, and all that. I think we want uh, more from the party, within the party. Uh, and I believe, that, I believe you fill that role. Uh, very well. Um, do, does uh, does that strategy entail anything? Like, I know vice presidential candidates are selected separately for libertarians. So, do you even have a consideration? Do you even think about that, or is that kind of left up to what the delegates pick and and who they want? Well, right now I'm just focused on winning this nomination. I mean, I, you know, you, you say that I'm the the front runner, but I mean, there's really there really isn't a front runner because nobody is nobody is bound or anything. Uh, and so delegates can change their mind today, or they can change their mind at the convention. Somebody could pop up at the convention and you know offer somebody some little sweet deal and get them to vote for them. Um, but my strategy just stays the same is that, hey, this is the kind of campaign I want to run. And I want to run it on your behalf, on the behalf of the party members. I, I want to be able to tell Americans what you're fighting for, what, why you've devoted your life to this cause. And some people have devoted themselves to this party for decades, uh, their money and so forth. And so the campaign that I want to run is a campaign of principle for the party of principle. I mean, we are the party of principle, for Fritz. That's, that's a self-designated label. Well, what does that mean? You know, how many LP members really give that some thought that what does that label mean? And, and when you assume a label, when you apply it to yourself, that means you, you're under a greater obligation to adhere, adhere to it as far as I'm concerned. Well, it means that we're different from the other two parties. We have a set of principles. We adhere to these principles. And if people look at them and say, well, Jacob, OK, I've looked at your principles. I, I don't agree with you. I'm not going to vote for you. OK, we may go down, but at least we go down fighting with, as who we are, which is libertarians rather than who we're not, which is Republican lights or Democrat lights. It's very good. And you do have a point about and I did say you are the leading candidate uh, on paper. Yes. Non-binding. Yes. Um, in terms of your opponents. Because uh, we are talking about Democrats and Republicans, it, the other people that you're on the stage with, uh, that you're debating with, I've watched, I've watched you in several debates now. Uh, some of them at the conventions, some of them uh, sponsored events. Uh, why do you stand out above? Why do you think you're the better choice over, say, an Adam Kokesh or, or a Dan Behrman uh, or a Lincoln Chafee even? Well, let me just say that that. I've gotten to know all the, the candidates and any anybody who is nominated among the people that are running would be better than Trump and Biden. I mean, there's no question about that. Hands, hands down. Yeah. But I mean, the, 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 the benefit of these debates is that they do highlight differences among the candidates and, and that those differences co have come out. Um, one of the differences that really manifested itself early on was on health care. That and you know, and it's hard for me to tell you which candidate stands where on what, but I know there are some candidates that say, well, we need to keep Medicare and Medicaid in existence and phase them out maybe over a period of time or reform them. Uh, you know, then a popular libertarian reform is health savings accounts. Uh, Social Security is another big difference. Is that 
the general consensus, it seems to me, among the, the, the candidates is, oh, well, it would be lack of compassion to just stop this program immediately. Well, I say, no, that it needs to be ended immediately. Um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Now, as a practical matter, can that happen? Well, of course not. You've got a Democrat-Republican Congress. But what, what I'm talking about is what we should be standing for as libertarians. We should be standing for liberty. So let's, let's assume lightning strikes and we, we get into these uh, presidential debates. After all, let's say people are so disgusted with the two parties that they say, let's go with this libertarian. Well, you know, who do you want in there in those debates? Somebody that's going to say, oh, I agree with Donald Trump and Joe Biden that Social Security is very important and that we need to phase it out over the next 40 years? Or do you want somebody saying there, look, this is a highly destructive program. Liberty works. You can get rid of this program today. You can, you can count on younger people to step up to the plate, help out children. I mean, children helping out parents and grandparents, church groups coming to assistance. In other words, a society where people keep everything they earn, no income tax, no FICA, and uh, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no mandatory charity at all, there's no doubt in my mind, Fritz, that everything would be fine. But that's because I really know that freedom works. And I, I think when somebody, when a libertarian is saying, oh gosh, we're pulling the carpet out, we, we need to show compassion. Well, for one, they're showing compassion through the Internal Revenue Service and the initiation of force, which I don't see as compassion at all. And two, they're expressing doubts that freedom works. I have no doubts that freedom will work. I favor the immediate repeal of these highly destructive socialist programs. I want to be free, and I know that freedom works. Very good. Thank you for your takes on that, sir. Um, with that being said, I want to dive right in. I don't even know where to start with the with the COVID-19 business. Um, this, this kind of rocked the world uh, about a month ago or a couple weeks ago, especially here in America. Um, this has kind of changed life right now. Uh, I, I, you already said it yourself, uh, the, the campaign and how you're uh, conducting the campaign and conventions is changing. How is it affecting the campaign trail? Well, tremendously. I mean, I went to, up to this point, I was going to conventions every weekend. And I don't know how many I've gone to, but I think it's about 18 uh, since I announced it, South Carolina. 18, 17 or 18 in the last, since January. And uh, the last three were this last weekend. I went to Illinois, uh, Virginia, and then Maryland. And then everything came to a screeching halt as of Sunday. That uh, several conventions were canceled this weekend. Uh, I was supposed to go to, to New Jersey and Massachusetts. Both of them were canceled. Uh, the following weekend, I was going to Washington State and Minnesota. Both of them canceled. And uh, after that, one still scheduled is Oregon. Texas is still scheduled. but And then there's still Utah and New Mexico. But I got doubts. Uh, Michigan was canceled, too. So it has dramatically altered the campaign trail here. We are now reorienting to going uh, online and, and, and campaigning there. We, nobody really knows what's going to happen with the national convention. It's scheduled in, at Memorial Day in Austin, and Austin is controlled by a, uh, one of the hardest core liberal leftist progressive bodies in, in the country. And so there's a good chance it's going to get canceled. We don't know what that means or how the LNC, the Libertarian National Committee, is going to respond. Um, so... But and may I go ahead and address the, the, the coronavirus thing? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of wanted to go top down with you from the initial response uh, from the outbreak here in, in the United States and how things like the CDC handled it, uh, things that got in the way of our response. Uh, absolutely. Uh, wherever you want to start with it. Yeah, that, that you know, the, the, the natural question that, that – a libertarian gets asked, and especially like here running for office, is, well, what would you do about the coronavirus uh, crisis? And, and everybody that asks that question is assuming the continued existence of the status quo, uh, the, the healthcare system we have, the economic system we have. And so they look at libertarianism, or they want to know how libertarianism is going to make their system work. Well, libertarianism has never been a philosophy that's going to make socialism and statism, interventionism, regulation work. 
that that's not what we purport to do. So when people have this crisis, you, you can't come to us libertarians and say, make our system work. What's your solution? What's the libertarian solution? And when we tell them this, they get really angry and they get really frustrated and upset because, oh, you libertarians are not practical. An analogy of this is like education. You know, the educational system's a mess. And so they come and say, well, what's the libertarian solution to education? Well, they're, what they want is the libertarian solution on how to make public schooling work. It, it doesn't right. exist. All right, so we have a healthcare system that is a socialist system. Um, it's, been, it's been the case since the 1960s, maybe even a little earlier than that. You know, I grew up in, in the poorest city in the United States. That's what the Census Bureau said about Laredo, Texas, back in the 1950s and early 60s. Uh, there was no, nobody had major medical insurance and nobody needed it. I mean, there wasn't even an issue of pre-existing conditions and that sort of thing because healthcare costs were so low and so stable that going to the doctors was like going to the grocery store. You know, how many people have grocery store insurance to protect against soaring grocery prices? Nobody. Right. And, and that's the way healthcare was. It was just so low and stable. It was like taking your car to the auto repair shop. And nobody worried about going bankrupt because they were so low. And, and taxes were so low because the welfare state really hadn't gotten going. You had Social Security in existence from the 30s, but it really hadn't gotten super expensive. And the same with the, the warfare state. So income taxes were fairly low. And so doctors were still making a lot of money. And, and, you know, I told you I grew up in the poorest city that doctors' offices every day were filled with, with patients, most of whom couldn't pay, or at least many of whom couldn't pay. Many of them were from Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, because Laredo was on the border. There was never a case where doctors turned anybody away for inability to pay. Same with our, our only hospital in town, Mercy Hospital, a Catholic hospital. Uh, they relied on donations and so forth. So this, it, this, it was the finest healthcare system. Doctors loved what they did. They made house calls. My family doctor, we would go to his house to get a tetanus shot. He'd come out to the car and give it to us on a weekend. There was innovations, inventions. It was a dynamic, vibrant healthcare system. Medicare and Medicaid come into existence. Massive demand on the system. That was the, that was the beginning of the end. Prices started soaring. Instead of getting rid of these two programs, they double down uh, the, the crisis after crisis after crisis. They end up getting Obamacare in that that was supposed to solve the problem. It gets worse now that you got you know, Bernie Sanders calling for full fledged socialized medicine like in Cuba and North Korea. All right. So you've got the and, and on top of this, you've got a centrally managed healthcare system sent, run out by the, the Centers for Disease Control. It's a federally managed healthcare system. This is what's called a socialist healthcare system, highly dysfunctional. With socialism, always comes crises. I mean, we've got an uh, education crisis because you got a socialist uh, educational system. All right. So for 30 years, Fritz, at the Future of Freedom Foundation, I've been saying there's only one solution to this. There is no other solution, and that is you've got to get rid of Medicare, you've got to get rid of Medicaid, you've got to get rid of uh, occupational licensure, which limits the supply of health care providers, you've got to get rid of uh, uh, regulation, control, management, a separation of health care in the state, a total free market health care system. And for 30 years, people said, Jacob, you're just too radical. Even libertarians have said, you're too radical. We need a minor reform like health savings accounts. And I keep telling people, I've said for 30 years, your reforms are not going to work. This is an inherently defective system. And so now we're, and, and the same thing with the economy. You've got a centrally managed economy, highly taxed, taking huge amounts of people's money. You've got, a, which is a socialist system. The income tax is one of the 10 planks of the communist manifesto. You've got a centrally managed system with the president at the top initiating trade wars with China, raising tariffs, you know, all kinds of stuff, with all with this obsession of just getting the stock market up. You've got a federal reserve system, which is a socialist system as well, that has totally destroyed what had been the finest monetary system in history. So you've got these three things coming together in a perfect storm. Because now you've got this major healthcare crisis, and what do you have to deal with it? 
you have a dysfunctional healthcare system, and you can see the dysfunctionality manifesting itself. They don't have enough kits. The, the Centers for Disease Control sends out a few. Turns out they're defective. Uh, everybody's running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Their only answer is tyranny, commands, orders, prohibitions. And meanwhile, the healthcare system is just, <laughs> just total dysfunction. And then you've got people losing their jobs with no savings. You know, how, how do they get through two or three months of this? Now, okay, so, and then you've got the Federal Reserve pumping up the, the bubble once again. That's all they know how to do. Uh, that, that's going to burst down the line. So w what is the libertarian answer? Well, the libertarian answer is what I've been saying for 30 years. Separate health care in the state. Get rid of mandatory charity and the income tax and FICA. Get rid of the Federal Reserve, uh, a free market monetary system. Now, let's just think about this. Uh, an imaginary experiment, uh, hypothetical. 20 years ago, let's say people said, Jacob, we're going to listen to you, and, and you are absolutely right. We're going to adopt what you're saying. All right, so no income tax. People keep everything they earn. Uh, and no, no more Medicare, Medicaid, all this junk, socialist junk. Today, 20 years later, the average family, let's say, has spent $20,000 in income taxes for the last 20 years. That would be $400,000 in savings in people's accounts, plus interest. Let's say that's $450,000. That's a lot of money to cover two or three months of not being without a job. And then at the same time, you'd have a vibrant health care system, one that doesn't have to look to the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, the, mar the free market produces the best of everything. The dynamism, the inventions, there'd be plenty of kits. We would be looking to guidance for, to the health care industry rather than to politicians and bureaucrats that don't know what they're doing. Now, to get a glimpse of this, you can see what's happening in Italy. Tremendous high death toll. Same in China. Tremendously high death toll from this thing and sickness toll. Well, is it a coincidence that Italy has a totally dysfunctional economy? I mean, they've, they've spent and they borrowed the, the citizenry into practical bankruptcy. And then at the same time, they have a socialist health care system, government provided. So is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Same with China. They have a socialist health care system. Now, they have a little bit more vibrant economy because they've They've loosened up over the last 20, 25 years. But that's the key to this. And have people listened to me for 30 years? No. But it's, not, it's never too late because five years from now, we may be facing another pandemic. And it's better that we get that free system in place today by separating healthcare in the state, separating charity in the state, separating money in the state, separating the economy in the state. There is no other solution. I've been saying this for 30 years. There's no other solution except libertarianism. That's um, that's a very good point. Uh, w w like one of the, I think one of the top criticisms with the whole CDC thing is the fact that there was so much red tape in place that that institutions couldn't privately run tests for this. Uh, I, the New York Times put out a great article with uh, from a doctor in Seattle, I believe, that. Uh, that was watching the global uh, trends and wanted to jump on it early and couldn't do it because the government did not allow it. Is that correct? Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's what comes with a centrally managed healthcare system. I mean, central planning is a core feature of socialism. What it means is that instead of having the market or what Friedrich Hayek called a spontaneous order coming up with solutions to, to societal problems, You've got a, a board, a government board, planning in a sort of top-down army command and control fashion. Well, it can't be done. Hayek called the planner the the, the fatal conceit uh, that he he has this conceit that he can uh, that he can actually plan the the solution to societal problems. He can't. But in a in a free market, you you capitalize on the individual knowledge of all these people. Who are, who are out there trying to figure out what the solution is. And your example of Seattle is a good one. There was, there was a lady there that was ready to, I think she was a nurse or nurse assistant or maybe a physician. She was ready to begin testing and the government officials told her to stop. And then uh, you mentioned the New York Times. They have a great article on their front page today that details all of the bureaucracy, the red tape 
that has gone into this thing. But that's an inherent part of a system that looks to government to plan, manage, and control health care. You, you see it in education. It's the exact same thing. And, and so this is, again, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but people want libertarians to come in and say, show us how to make this system work. And what I'm saying is it's an inherently defective system. Uh, an inherently defective system is not broken. It's inherently defective, which means it cannot be fixed. Socialism is an inherently defective paradigm. The best thing Americans could do at this very moment is just free up the healthcare system entirely, get government totally out of it at all three levels, federal, state, and local, and get rid of Medicare and Medicaid immediately. You would see a resurgence of, of a healthy system immediately, a vibrant system. Yeah, it's, from the sound of it, too many hurdles, too many roadblocks, too many checks that need to be met just because it's a, a central system. Yeah, and, and look how you have this shortage of testing kits. I mean, you know, yeah. this is classic socialism where you end up with these, these manifest shortages. And then, oh, and then here's the other thing. You get the elites getting the tests because you see they, they only have a certain number, so they have to allocate them. They have to ration them. And who, who gets the rationing? Well, the movie stars, the big sports figures, the politically elite, while all of us commoners, we get left out. But, but that's the way. So if you go to Cuba and, and, you, and you, 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 they'll tell you, oh, everybody's here equal in this society. Well, not exactly. Some people are more equal than other people. And, and the political elites are the ones that get the benefits and, the, and the, the larger stipends and so forth. It's the same thing in this system. It, it's, a, it's a dysfunctional, aberrant system. And it's, what's fascinating to me is that people are paying the ultimate price for this. I mean, this isn't just a delayed operation. This is death we're dealing with, which is absolutely fascinating to me that people are having to pay the price for, for having adopted this, this screwed up aberrant system. That, that is a very deep way of, of putting it. And I, I think too many people are looking to the government to figure out and solve the problem and, and give them that peace of mind again. And it's just not happening. Yeah, and, and, and here's the thing is that people are looking to government to solve the problem with tyranny. I mean, look at look what's going on. You have governors that are acting like dictators. Uh, they're not even going to their legislature and saying, can I have permission to shut down everybody's businesses? They're just issuing decrees. I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating. This, this is the essence of dictatorship, where, where one person can just tell another person, you will stay at home, and if you're not in your home, we will put you in jail. And make no mistake about it, they are prepared to, to summon the National Guard, the military, to enforce these orders. I mean, so you've got this dysfunctional health care system. Rather than dismantling it immediately, which would bring about this resurgence of health in the health care industry, they're doubling down with tyranny and oppression and mandates, and behind it all is the jail. You don't comply, and we're, we're going to do bad things to you. It's, it's an absolutely, it's, it's like a case study in tyranny and oppression and socialism. It, it's crazy to me um, because it, it would seem in a time like this, the, the last thing you would want to do is start throwing people in jail for more or less a, a trivial crime. Um, one that you made up just because you're not obeying a curfew, per se. Um, I mean, it's one thing to, to want to enact social distancing, to minimize the impact, but how far can you go? I mean, New Jersey has, has uh, uh, curfews right now from like 8 o'clock at night to 5 o'clock in the morning because apparently viruses are most vital during those times, I guess, not during the day. You know, California is, is telling people... You're not allowed to leave your homes, but we're going to keep essential functions like the grocery store open. But where does that make sense if nobody can leave their home to go to the grocery store? <laughs> well, th this is what Ludwig von Mises called planned chaos. That it's always what socialism produces, planned chaos. And what better term to describe what's going on today? I mean, it, it, the term just perfectly demonstrates what is happening. There is chaos and it's coming from the planners. I mean, it really goes to show, Fritz, the failure of this welfare 
warfare state system. Now, you know, we haven't talked about the warfare state and the fiasco and catastrophe, all their interventions and assassinations and coups and bombings and so forth. We're sticking with the domestic issue, but I mean, if if there's nothing else that shows the 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 utter moral, economic, and health bankruptcy of Democrats and Republicans and what they've done to our country. I mean, we we had the finest healthcare system in the world. We had no mandatory charity. Our country was founded on on no income tax, no social security, no mandatory charity. Now there was some uh, some negative founding principles like slavery and things like that, but there were some good founding principles and. Yet here, Democrats and Republicans came along and destroyed it all with Social Security, mandatory charity, which destroyed family values through this coercion, and then um, putting faith in, in the IRS to, to bring care and compassion to the American political process, in socialist health care system, socialist educational system. America once had no public schooling systems at all, no immigration controls, no drug war. And, and then you look at every aspect of the, the status paradigm that Democrats and Republicans have brought, it's a catastrophe. And this is why in this campaign, it's not a question of Donald Trump being a bad man, a bad person. This is what Democrats would like to portray him as. And it's not a question of whether Joe Biden is, is too old or his mental acumen is not as high as it used to be. It doesn't have anything to do with those things. This has to do with systems. You have a bad system in place, and whoever is in charge of that system is, is still going to be a catastrophe. So what I bring to this campaign, what I'm trying to bring, is a heightened awareness that with libertarianism, you're going to get an entirely different system. You're not going to get just a better pe person to run this office, to run this system, because I'm not that person. Nobody is. But what we're talking about is let's get a free market system, system based on limited government in there rather than the dysfunctional socialist interventionist system that they call free enterprise. That's the real irony is that they've all been indoctrinated into thinking that all the socialism is free enterprise, uh, but it's not. And so that's what I bring to the table and would love to bring to the table in this campaign. If you like the direction that Democrats and Republicans are taking our country, go vote for them. Go vote for Donald Trump, vote for Biden. It doesn't matter. But if you want a different direction, a direction of health and peace and prosperity and liberty and harmony, come with come with us and preferably, hopefully come with me if I win this nomination. I think that's a great way of putting it. Do you want to change just the person sitting at the top of it? Do you want to change the face or do you want to dynamically change the system? I think that's what your 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 drive home point is. That's exactly it, because all they're fighting for. All the let's say Biden gets a nomination, it's pretty clear he's going to win it. Yeah. That, that all they're fighting for is control, uh, money, the money that comes with with being in charge, the largesse, the power, the adulation, uh, and so it's musical chairs. They'll go George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, or Joe Biden, or whatever. It doesn't matter. They're playing musical chairs. The system doesn't change. Now, people thought that Trump was going to change. That, that's why a lot of libertarians supported Trump. Well, you know, his drain the swamp thing was brilliant because, you know, you conjure up this image of Washington, D.C. being this swampland with alligators and crocodiles and snakes and all this. And that he was going to dry it up. He's turned out to be no different from Hillary Clinton. I mean, he's still remember, he said, I'm going to bring home the troops from the forever wars and I'm going to do it right away. He's been in there for three years. The generals have taken charge. He's got troops in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. He's trying to start a war with, with Iran. He's got these brutal sanctions against the Iranian people who are suffering horribly with this coronavirus. And, and Trump is making it worse with his sanctions. And, and it isn't phasing him a bit. And, and so how is he different from Hillary Clinton? These are all things that Hillary Clinton would have done. He is spending a trillion dollars more before the corona crisis, a trillion dollars more than what the government's bringing in in taxes. I mean, big spender Trump, would Hillary Clinton have spent that much? Oh, that's not all. He's now proposing an additional trillion dollars in spending. So that means the debt goes from 23 trillion to 24 trillion to 25 trillion. Oh, by the way, this is what is bankrupting Italy. This is what bankrupted Greece. Uh, so they're just playing musical chairs, Fritz. It, it's, you hit the nail on the head. 
What I'm bringing to the table is an entirely different system that restores liberty, peace, prosperity to the private sector. So instead of the private sector being serfs on this welfare, warfare state plantation, they now got freedom to manage their own lives in the context of a free market economic healthcare system, educational system, and the like. That that's a brilliant way of putting it, and I like that spirit of of. I think that's the the good of libertarian approach. We're not trying to fix what's currently in place. We're trying to give you something completely different, something that you haven't seen before. Exactly, and it's founded on the good founding principles of this country. That's the problem. We abandoned those good principles, or Democrats and Republicans did. All that we libertarians are saying to people, look, when something's wrong with your society, it's good to go back to founding principles. When something's wrong with your life, that's a good time to say, you know, I need to go go back, do a little meditating and thinking and reflecting on what I've done with my life here. How can I get it back on the right track? So all we libertarians are saying, let's go back to, to the good founding principles of America uh, private charity, uh, no coerced uh, compulsion uh, on charity. People keep everything they earn. They decide what to do with it. Uh, no sanctions and embargoes. Americans free to travel and trade all over the world. Dismantle the national security state, which is a totalitarian form of governmental structure. Restore a limited government republic with a basic military force, which was our founding governmental system. Uh, end the drug war by legalizing all drugs, not just marijuana open the borders, free trade, and open immigration. Now we're talking about the, the sound founding principles of this country, an entirely different system, and, and a system that worked. I mean, this is the real irony. I mean, we had, we had the healthiest society in history. We had the, the most prosperous society, the wealthiest society, the most charitable society in history. And all that was destroyed with the statism of Democrats and Republicans. Up in flames, absolutely. Uh, Jacob, as we get ready to wrap up here, is there any talking point subject that you wanted to bring up? The, the main thing this campaign's about, Fritz, is about liberty. I mean, this is this is what drove me to enter this race. I want to be free, and freedom necessarily entails identifying what the infringements on liberty are. And socialism is one of the gigantic infringements, and then removing them. Because if all we do is succeed in reforming the infringements on freedom, we wouldn't have, we will not have achieved freedom. I mean, think, think slavery. You know, would slavery reform have meant freedom for the slaves? You know, fewer lashings, uh, better work conditions? No. That to achieve freedom, you've got to dismantle the structure of freedom. And in order to achieve freedom in our lifetime, and, and achieving freedom 40 years from now has no interest for me. I want freedom now. And in order to do that, we have to make the case for dismantling the infringements on freedom, because with each infringement that's dismantled, people will then start feeling the exhilaration that comes with freedom, and they'll want to get all the other infringements over with, too, because then we're talking about genuine liberty. And if people want to learn more or you want to support my, my campaign, please come to jacobforliberty.com. Uh, we're going to reorient now to doing online stuff, but you can see all the things we're doing on my blog, my appearances, the media, and so forth. Uh, this is an exciting campaign so far. We're hoping to keep it that way, even though things are getting reoriented. Absolutely. I was just about to ask you where can they find you on the internet, but you took care of that without me even asking. So, uh, Jacob, thank you for your time, for coming on the FritzCast. Uh, you're, you're the second presidential candidate I've had on. Uh, this was uh, a very good conversation. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to do it. Oh, the honor and pleasure are all mine. I loved it. Thank you for giving me a time to, to share my thoughts.